Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, the 58th verse. Therefore, my dear brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling. King James says abounding in the Lord's work, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Anytime I read in Scripture the word therefore, it jumps out at me and grabs my attention because it arouses my curiosity to want to know what happened before that statement. Because the word therefore means that something has previously happened or something was said that needed further comment or an explanation or a command that requires an action on our part or a response on our part or a blessing to us. And so when I read this verse, my curiosity kicks in and I go back to preceding verses and into the 14th chapter of Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth. And I see what he's talking about. There were those that did not understand or just did not believe in the resurrection of the human body. And for some reason, it had seeped into the church at Corinth. And we don't know, but most likely, both Gentiles and Jewish people, opponents of the resurrection, had discussed with the Corinthian believers and aroused their suspicion and made them believe that there was no resurrection of the human body. And they gave all of their reasoning for it. And in one part of Paul's addressing this matter, considering all the things that Paul dealt with concerning the Corinthian church. He dealt with all matters of life circumstances, lifestyles, and considering all of those, now he goes to a theological thing that concerns the resurrection of the body from the dead. And unfortunately, that same kind of question of doubt can come into the minds of people even today. Even people in the church could have understandable reasons for questioning the resurrection. Now, let me give you an example. There are some people who have maybe lost limbs or suffered great injury and had all kinds of things happen to them through war, through accident or whatever, and would question how can a person in part be buried and another part be somewhere else in the world, on a battlefield, the depth of the sea, the stomach of a shark. How can the body be resurrected whole and complete? And so this whole concept had crept into the Corinthian church, and Paul felt need to address it. Other people believe that the soul of man is immortal. But the body is only for this life, and 
when this life is over, the body will decay and just never be resurrected again. And it would be preposterous to ever think that in the natural mind that a body that's diseased and sick with all kinds of uh, maladies would be resurrected again. So that's in today's world even. And then some people even try to spiritualize the thing by saying that the resurrection happens when the person dies and the soul leaves the body, that that constitutes the resurrection. And so they argue that point. Well, Paul addressed this theological issue from a very practical standpoint because he knew that he and the Corinthian believers shared one special thing in common, one common thought in which they believed. And they knew, both Paul and the Corinthian believers, knew that the life of Adam had affected all generations following him. How many of you believe that Adam's life still affects life today? Amen. And he then drew the comparison saying that the life of Jesus Christ affected all of the life in this present world when he walked on this planet and it affects all of humanity in generations following him. So he used that and he used that personal effect that joined Christ with everyone that would follow him. He even appealed to the Corinthians to consider his own strong, his own life as a strong evidence that the future resurrection of believers was an essential to Christian belief. It's not possible to justify sacrifices involved in living for Christ without the hope of the resurrection. I'm going to say that again because some of you didn't get it. It's impossible to justify all of the sacrifices that people make in serving the Lord without the reality of a resurrection. There have been missionaries, people even in their own homeland, who have been killed mercilessly at the hands of opponents of Christians, and it would be awful to discount the resurrection for the sacrifice of their lives. So to make the position perfectly clear, Paul stated that the existence of the natural or the ordinary body necessitates the existence of the resurrection or the, the existence of the spiritual renewal by the Holy Spirit, that body. You see, he stressed that without it, there is no hope. But because of the resurrection, we do have hope. In previous chapters and verses that Paul was talking about this, he introduced some new ideas that the Corinthians had not considered. He put these ideas into his argument and his statement about the resurrection in, in this whole letter as a whole. First, he asserted that death results from sin. Had Adam never sinned, we would be living in a utopia right now. Had Adam never sinned, we would all be living in one great planetary garden. Not necessarily the Garden of Eden where Adam dwelt, but this whole planet would be this planet of perfection. And there would be no pain, no suffering, no disease. There would be no violence. There would be nothing that would disrupt our lives. It would all be grand, glorious, and wonderful to enjoy. 
So he brought to their thoughts that death results from sin. Secondly, he declared that sin inflicts its sting of death through the law. Through the law. Sin is what inflicts the sting of death. And so then the resurrection is essential to the gospel that saves believers from their sins. In fact, if there is no resurrection, sin is never defeated. If there is no resurrection, neither would sin ever be defeated. I remember reading the story of two missionaries. They were watching this great parade of Buddhists following in, a, in an order, headed to the tomb wherein lay the bones of Buddha. And one missionary said to the other, if one bone of Christ were ever discovered beneath the surface of this earth, all of Christianity would be shattered apart. And that is so true because Jesus rose from the dead completely whole, completely together, and He ascended on high and is at the right hand of the Father ever interceding for us. Therefore, the verse in our text tells us two things. It gives us an exhortation for service and an encouragement for service. First tells us about serving and then tells us what we're going to receive for serving. He said, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling or abounding in the Lord's work. This exhortation is twofold. First of all, he calls for faithful service and then to be fervent in our service. Faithful service is very plainly explained where he says, be steadfast, immovable, always. Key word. Be steadfast, immovable, always. The word steadfast means firm, fixed, delivered, I mean determined, purposed, and faithful. That's what steadfast means. And as Christians, we are to stand fast and fixed. Having done all to stand, stand. With our minds fixed on things above not letting anything on this earth shake us. Neither do these things shake us, but we are founded and grounded. Hallelujah. We are to be faithful to the very end. Paul wrote and said, you did run the race well, but what did hinder you? Some allow hindrances to cause them to stumble along the way. Now really and truly, when you get right down to the brass tacks, I think that's a South Georgia term. When you get right down to the core of the matter, we really need this exhortation in churches everywhere. I'm not just preaching about Connection Point. I'm talking about Christianity as a whole. I'm talking about church life as a whole. We need this exhortation in all churches. Why? Because far too many people are not faithful. They cannot be counted on to do the task for very long. They cannot be counted on to do the things that they committed to do. They will either quit or just simply not show up to do their job. You know what would happen if you just, without notice, didn't show up for your job tomorrow? 
But our God is gracious. I saw a picture once of God. It was a picture, a sketch of God sitting at the computer, looking at the screen, ready to press the button command that says smite. I've been privileged to serve in various capacities in, throughout the course of my ministry. And for 20 years I worked with pastors and evangelists. And I saw far too many pastors faced with the frustrating experience of having teachers and officers and elders and council members of a church not show up on Sunday to do their job. And it was perplexing to them, discouraging to them. It was downheartening to them. In fact, several came to me when I was serving in certain roles. Several came to me saying, I'm resigning my church. God is through with me at that church. And upon inquiry, I would find the real root of their thinking. It was because of their disappointment of people who were unfaithful. People upon whom you could not count. It's getting mighty quiet in here. I'll tell you this, a lack of faithfulness in service is one of the big problems in churches all across the country, everywhere. And then it calls for fervent service, always abounding in the work of the Lord, excelling in the work of the Lord always. Excelling means doing the will of God. Abounding means doing the will of God promoting His glory, and advancing His kingdom. We have one job that's number one, and that is we are to be ambassadors for Christ, every one of us. We may not be a preacher in a pulpit, but we're a preacher in a street. We're a preacher on the workplace. Why? Because we are living epistles. Epistles are not wives of the apostles. <laughs> epistles are letters. We are living epistles, read of all men. Wherever we go, people either see Jesus in us or they see something else in us. They either know we are guided and directed by a higher hand or we are winging it on a selfie. You understand what I'm saying? The phrase all, always abounding in the work of the Lord means to be engaged, not only to be engaged in, but it means to be engaged in the work of the Lord diligently. Engaged in the work of the Lord laboriously. Engaged in the work of the Lord, excelling in the, work of the, in the work of the Lord, which means that which God requires. Go ye into all the world, teaching all nations whatsoever things I have commanded you. Everything that He has taught us, our chief responsibility, number one, is to tell others. That's why I say we each one are evangelists everywhere we go. We may not have to take a text and preach a sermon, but we live a sermon. We live a life that shines in other people's dark world. And that light becomes hope to them. That light becomes help to them. That light becomes life for them because they start saying I want what he has or I want what she has 
I want to have the peace that they walk around in. I want my life to feel together. And I know what some of you are thinking. I serve God, but my life sure doesn't feel together. You know why? Because most of us could star in Phantom of the Opera. Because most of us have learned how to wear the mask really well. We hurt, we suffer, we're in pain, we worry, we're anxious, we're filled with fear at home. But when we come to church with our brothers and sisters, we have on that mask and we smile and everything looks holy and wholesome and everybody thinks we've got it all together, but inside we feel like we're dying. Does anybody understand what I'm saying today? So this work of the Lord means that which the Lord requires. So I ask you today, have you recently asked yourself, what does God require of me? Have you asked yourself, what does God require of me? My sweet mother, in all of her now days of forgetting and repetitious com uh, conversation, she will repeatedly say to Brenda and me, or anybody else that's gone in to visit with her, she will make this statement. I ask myself the question, have I already gone 20 minutes? Forget it. <laughs> My mother repeats to us, she said, you know, I've been asking myself lately and asking God, God, have I done everything that I could do? Have I done everything that I should have done? Have I done all that I could do to help somebody else? And then she would say something like this. Never in my life did I expect that my life would end up like this in one room separated by a curtain. Sharing it with somebody I don't even know. But I've made up my mind. If this is what God has for me, then I'm going to make the best of it and do what I can to help somebody here that might need Him. Now that is being diligent. So we need to ask ourselves today, what have I done? Have I done enough? What do you require of me, God? Well, let me tell you this. Doing the work of the Lord, fulfilling what God requires following what He's called us to do, whether it's in volunteer work or paid. You look up here at me and, and, and you say, man, pastor's got it made. Works two hours a week. <laughs> He's got it all together and no, he doesn't have all these things that bother me. Wrong. Because you see, I am subject to the same things that face you day by day. David said, I will, what? Bless the Lord at all times. But he also said, I will build myself up. I will pull myself together. I will exalt the Lord. I will encourage myself in the Lord. And there are some times you cannot wait for me or 
Pastor Grant or Pastor Larry. You can't wait for a Sunday school teacher or some other person to encourage you. There are times then when you, brother, sister, need to just sit down and encourage yourself in the Lord and say, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world, and I am more than a conqueror through him who loved me. Hallelujah. Praise God. So I'll warn you right now, this thing of doing what God's called us to do, doing what God requires of us can become tiresome quickly. In fact, so much so, Paul addressed that to the Galatians. And he wrote to the Galatians and said this, so we must not get tired of doing good, for we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, glory to God. That simply means we keep on keeping on. We keep on keeping on. We keep climbing higher. We keep ourselves prayed up, packed up, and ready to go up, knowing that we have fulfilled what God has commissioned us to do. Bless His name. To me, that verse certainly spells fervency. Few abound, and far too many do just enough to get by. Do just enough of God. Three dollars worth of God, please. I read that as a book title one time. And the author had the whole book talking about people who wanted to do just enough to get by. The word also says that this fervency is not to be short term, but long term. Always is fervency that's not considered a fly-by-night emotional thing, but a continual fervency, a persistent passion. When I pastored in Spartanburg, South Carolina, I had a very close friend who was a, a pastor of an African-American church. and He and I often swapped pulpits without announcements. And I would show up at his church or he would show up at my church. We would exchange pulpits and just threw everybody off. But we always had church. So one day he and I were talking and he said that he was telling me that his brother was just so mean. His brother just would not live right. And he said that he was so bad about not living right that nothing he as a minister could do would persuade him but one night in an old church out in the country way out of town they had a revival and he went to the altar that night gave his heart to the Lord my friend said you could hear my brother a mile down the road yelling I got a legion I got a legion Lord I got a legion Lord let me tell you something salvation is not just religion there are all kinds of religions but salvation is what carries us to heaven and some people lack that fervency it's a it's a fly-by-night emotional thing that same pastor shared with me said I was so proud that my brother got saved but two weeks later we had to get him out of jail because he got into a drunken fight in a bar room somewhere. And he put it like this. He caught on fire good, but he burned up quick. And then Paul gives us encouragement for service. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord, we need this encouragement. 
the church world needs this encouragement because far too many times our work for the Lord seems to be a thankless job. There there are no compliments. There are not any expressions of appreciation. And then you see little results. You expect one result and it just is the opposite of that. And you ask yourself the question, is it even worth it? Is it worth me studying all this time to teach a lesson and everybody look at me stone face? Is it is it worth it for me to spend hours preparing a message and nobody respond? That's the kind of stuff I have to do with. You think it does it great at me? It grates at me spiritually just like things great at you. It plays on your emotions. It plays on your mind. And the mind is the enemy's workhouse. Satan's workplace and he'll cause you to get so discouraged and despondent that you'll say I may as well just give it up but I say to you don't give it up cheer up hallelujah this verse says it does pay to serve the Lord Serving God is not in vain no matter what your work is. No matter how little people respond, no matter how things don't change, no matter how things don't get any better, obedience in your activity will receive a reward. God sees your work and your service and He's going to reward it. Your work will produce fruit. It may not be seen in this life, but sooner or later, it'll show up. It'll show up. Your service for the Lord is not in vain. When we don't immediately see the kind of results we want, we then have a responsibility of taking upon ourselves a heavenly perception. Take on a heavenly perception. Think about it as my work here is not for this life. Keep playing. Oh, here, James. Keep playing, James. I thought you quit on me. I thought Bernard had come to the keyboard. You guys are messing with me. See what I'm saying? This is the kind of stuff that I have to deal with. In doing what we know to do for God can maybe be more understood if we understand it in a heavenly perception. Even if we don't see the good right now that comes from our work, if we truly believe that Christ has won the ultimate victory, that belief in itself will affect the way you live right now. We believe that the way Adam lived affected all of future generations. We believe that Christ's life on earth affected all future generations. You don't know and may never know until eternity the impact that you make on individuals while serving God in this life. Amen. Let me, let me give you an illustration in closing. I have a 17-year-old grandson. I don't know if I've shared this with you or not, but if I have, it bears repeating. I have a 17-year-old grandson that is dating this young girl she was complaining to him one day saying I just don't have any money 
I've got to get a better job. I just don't have any money. The 17-year-old boy looked at her and said, Do you pay tithes? You have a job. Do you pay tithes? She said, Pay tithes? I don't have enough money to pay tithes. He said, What? Get out of here. You make $60 a week. What is $6 going to hurt you to put in an envelope and give it to God because it belongs to Him anyway? A 17-year-old boy saying that. And then he followed it up and he said, I promise you, if you'll start giving God what's His, He'll give you a better job and you'll have more money. And then you'll still give Him His. That boy may end up being a preacher, not a journalist. He practices what his mother and daddy taught him. And they taught him because their parents taught them. Obedience is better than sacrifice. And when we give God what is His, it's not a sacrifice, it's obedience. And so she took him up on it. Next Sunday, she took $6. She looked at him, put it in the giving envelope, put it in the offering plate. Next week, she took out $6 looked at him put it in an envelope put it in the offering plate the third Sunday she picked up her purse took out six dollars picked up the envelope from the chair in front of her looked again at Nicholas put it in the offering plate. By that third Sunday, she was getting wearisome. You understand what I'm saying? She was saying, okay, he said it would, it hasn't. What am I doing? Is it worth it? She, the third Sunday, paid her tithes. That next week, she got a call and got a better job paying her more than she was making. That's what I'm talking about. Never give up. When you don't see the results immediately that you want to see, you don't throw in the towel and quit. In your marriage, in your marriage, when things don't go the way you want them to go right then, you don't throw in the towel and walk away. You work your way through it. <laughs> Lovingly. Not my turf, your turf. Lovingly, you work through it. Let me give you another example. When I was a young boy, my mother and dad went on a vacation and we, they, they rented a cottage down at the lake near Cordell, Georgia. Up here they call it Cordell. Down there we call it Cordell. And we were there for a week and in the house next door, they had signs all in the yard with scripture verses all over. So my mother, being the lady that she is, went immediately to meet the people in that house because it was obviously obvious that they loved the Lord. And the lady said to her, I've prayed for nine years to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and I never have. And I'm beginning to wonder if there even is such a thing as the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I know I receive the Holy Spirit of Christ in salvation, but is there really such a thing that people talk about, about the baptism of the Holy Ghost because I've been praying nine years and haven't received that. So my mother talked with her, prayed with her. During that same week while we were there, 
that lady in her private devotions not even praying for the baptism of the Holy Ghost just unexpectedly received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You see, God will reward you if you stay patient and persistent and pursue what He wants you to have. Amen. We serve a steadfast God. Did you hear me? We serve a steadfast God. He will always give you an answer. He will always come through for you. Malachi 3 and 6 says, For I am the Lord, I change not. That is steadfastness. Paul wrote to the Philippians and said, And my God, my God shall supply all your needs according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Do you understand what the Word says? Now I want you to listen. He'll always come through for you. Have you ever had God answer a prayer for you in the past? Raise your hand. All over this room, you've had a prayer answered. Can I tell you? He'll come through for you and He'll do it again just like He did before. That you cannot get through Right now it seems That there is no way out And you're going under God's proven time And time again He will be there for you He'll do it again friend. He'll do it again He'll do it again yes,
If he's ever come through for you once, he'll do it again and again and again because we have a steadfast God and he always just calls for us to be steadfast. Father, I thank you today for your word. I thank you for your own steadfastness. I thank you, God, because you, you hear every prayer. You see every labor. You see every toil. You see every discouragement when results don't come the way we want them to or when we want them. But you still reward. You still bless. And you still answer the prayers of your people. Now, Father, I pray today for this congregation, for your hand to be mighty upon them, for your hand to be a blessing to them, for your hand to right now give that encouragement, give that absolute assurance that you will see each one through. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.